In these days of globalization, more and more countries are recognizing the need to have a positive brand image. After all, if people perceive a nation in a positive way, they'll be more likely to visit it, invest in it and buy its products. So governments are spending more and more money on what's referred to as nation branding, branding a country in much the same way as you would a product. Whether you're a car company or a celebrity or a city, these days it seems everyone's talking about the value of having a good brand image, and countries are no exception. Just ask Simon Anhold to term the phrase nation branding 12 years ago. During the last 12 years or so, it's become, it's become almost an obsession. You, you wouldn't believe the number of governments that get in touch with me and say, we've got a rubbish image, and, and can we fix it? And I always say, the, my question is always the same, is it perhaps because you're a rubbish country? But you can see why countries are interested. After all, a better image can boost everything from exports to foreign investment to immigration to tourism. The problem is, as countries embrace nation branding, spending millions, they don't realise just how difficult it is. I don't think you can brand a country in the way that you might be able to brand a product for all sorts of reasons. And I think that there is a kind of megalomania, actually, in trying to do it. Megalomania or not, this cultural event in London is part of a nation branding exercise held to enhance people's image of Poland. In the case of Poland, for instance, it, the, one of the main problems is it's just not particularly well known, doesn't have much perceptions uh, in, in Europe. And the perceptions people do have aren't entirely flattering. They think of it as down at heel a bit, um, you know, post-Soviet and somehow abnormal. The modern Polish stereotype since the Polish invasion, so to speak, over the last few years in the UK has been that of, of the plumber and the worker. So it's, it's been, it's positive, but it's not very highbrow, so to speak. Well, I've certainly found out something about Poland tonight. It's a great place to go if you like vodka. Of course, there are other things to learn about the country here. But can an event like this really make a difference when it comes to transforming a nation's image? It's a great example of the painstaking hard work that, that genuinely shifting a nation's image takes. Um, it's not about uh, ad campaigns or logos or slogans. But why shouldn't countries just use a glossy ad campaign that could reach millions? Ad campaigns are not usually that credible because this, it's, this, it's like saying I'm cool. Well, by saying it, you know that it's not true. Very likely, if some bloke comes on the TV and tells me that Kazakhstan is the most wonderful country on earth, I'll just be more persuaded that it's rubbish. Of course, at a cost of billions, one of the biggest nation branding exercises a country can embark on is hosting an Olympic Games, as China has just done. But does that work? And I think what China has discovered is that although the games have been immensely choreographed, they've also brought the spotlight on things that they don't really want the rest of the world to be talking about. Things like the dubbing of the girl singing the national anthem and, there was, uh, and some other things like that, which was kind of the reinforced preconceptions of, of China. Building a reputation is like filling a bathtub when somebody's stolen the plug. And, you know, you pour a big bucket of water in when you, when you host a happy, successful Olympics. But, you know, almost by the time you've finished celebrating the success of it, the water's run out and people have stopped thinking about you again. But what about unplanned events? How can they affect a nation's image? In a recent nation branding survey of global media stories, Austria, a country that's normally got a very positive image, plunged to number 146, thanks largely to its recent cellar scandals. I think those sort of bits of bad news make a lot of noise for a sh relatively short amount of time. As long as it's not in the top five things that you know about the place, then it's not really affecting the brand. But Austria we don't know much about, so they find a girl locked in a cellar that impacts the brand for a little while, till it falls out of the top five. As for things you can control, essentially good nation branding comes down to enhancing your reputation by what you do, not what you say. Germany, for example, has a high-quality image, largely because it has sold high-quality products to the world for decades. That says more for a country than any marketing could, despite what some PR agencies might say.
Most of the time they're wasting, it's a wicked, wicked waste of taxpayers' money. When they're, when they're trying to do mass communications, when they're trying to do a Coca-Cola job on a country, that is an unforgivable waste of taxpayers' money. Which might be good news for Germany, because according to Anhalt, it has the best image of the 50 countries surveyed in his latest nation brand index. Thank you.